All right, so we're talking with Robert Brzezostiner. Thank you so much for talking with me. Of course. Um, so I think yesterday you were called the Indiana Jones of positive psychology. So what's that about? <laughs> Just starting right off with the embarrassing questions. Um, Chris Peterson, I think, coined the term Indiana Jones of positive psychology because of my research, uh, which is largely happens outside of the laboratory and, and utilizes populations and samples of, of people that are um, mostly overlooked by, by traditional psychological studies and veers far more towards the, the anthropological. So I've, I've um, lived and worked with the Amish, the, the Maasai in Kenya, Greenlandic hunters at the northern tip of Greenland, sex workers in Calcutta, homeless people in California, and, and other very non-traditional groups. So what draws you to those groups? Uh, in part, just a desire to travel, a curiosity about culture, wanting to, to be other places and learn about um, just other very basic ways of, of living. Um, yeah. I think that there are certain limits to, to the generalizability of, of uh, traditional samples of, and psychological studies. Um, and, and I just wanted, uh, rather to, than to make assumptions about, for example, people living in slums, um, just to go find out from them what their quality of life is actually like. Yeah. So what's something that you learned that was kind of surprising to you? Uh, with those people? I, I, like, yeah, I think one of the, the big surprises for me, especially where the, the homeless are concerned, yeah. um, is that people living in, in the slums of Calcutta, even, even those living in really dire uh, poverty, are faring better uh, emotionally and in terms of their life satisfaction than their their homeless counterparts in the United States, which is interesting because homeless people in the United States actually have much better access to to material concerns, to to free food from from you know soup kitchens uh, yeah. and and that type of thing, you know sleeping bags, uh, dental care, um, shelters, all all sorts of things that that people in Calcutta don't have. And yet the people in Calcutta have maintained their social bonds. They're, they're often with their families instead of estranged from their families. And, and those social connections serve to really buffer them against the dire effects of poverty. Okay, so can you apply what you learned in, say, Calcutta or with, or with the Amish to kind of your general population? Do you, do you find a lot of overlap there? Or a lot of kind of well, different ways of I, I, I think that it, um, where, where just sort of everyday folks, you know, here in Philadelphia or wherever are concerned, um, is that it, it suggests the importance of social relationships uh, and, and that connection, which in some ways doesn't need to be stressed. I mean, we yeah. all have an intuitive understanding that relationships yeah. are important, but this shows um, that, that those relationships that we consider sort of you know, just normal everyday occurrences serve as a protective factor um, yeah. against uh, you know some slippage into to sort of the the darker socioeconomic aspects of life. Yeah, yeah, that's cool. So, uh, so you have a very active role in in your research. You're traveling around, getting like out in the field. Where'd that come from? Is that part of like your background at all, or? Uh, well, certainly travel is part of my background. Yeah. When I was um, when I was nine, uh, my family moved to the United States Virgin Islands, which was a, a very cool move from a kid growing up uh, next to cornfields in Illinois. Um, but from there, um, my parents took me in a, a little dugout canoe up the Amazon to, to um, visit a, a tribe of people, the Yagua, who, who really hadn't been visited all that much before. This was in the very, very early 1980s. Yeah. And, um, you know, that, it's a pretty eye-opening experience for a, a child of nine to see these yeah. um, people living in these stilt houses and using blow guns to, to hunt monkeys and other animals. Yeah. Um, and, and you can't return back to Illinois and, and sort of just accept life there as usual without realizing right this second there are people who are who are living in such unusual and, and fascinating ways. Like, I mean, just to think right this second there are tons of people who are asleep right now because it's nighttime. Like even yeah. even that fundamental fact that that we're not all experiencing the same thing everywhere in the oh, world yeah. simultaneously. Yeah, I, yeah. Think is I always think like right now someone's dying or someone's being born or someone's just got diagnosed with cancer or they just got engaged. You know, there's so yeah, much going absolutely. On so. Um, so was that mainly how you got your education in psychology by getting out there? And then how does that apply to the way you teach psychology? Um, 
my my educational background is a little bit non-traditional. Um, unlike many people who who've done well in psychology, you know, they they tended to be pretty good students. That's how they got into graduate school. They tend to be um, you know fairly conscientious, a little bit detail oriented, or or socially gifted. If maybe if they're they're clinicians or teachers, I don't know. Um, I I wrestled with the structure of school. I. I don't handle structure well. I don't handle rules well. I, I my my first expulsion from school came uh, in Montessori school and preschool. Um, okay, if you get expelled from Montessori school, <laughs> yeah. what were you like? Lightning is on fire. I, I was promoting a, a real collective work habit instead of the individual it's focus. Like a riot. That, yeah, just you know, if we all work together, we'll just get it done quicker and we can okay. move on to the play. Right, um, right. It just wasn't a good fit. Yeah, so um, you were like making slave labor, like making the other kids work for you, basically. Minions. <laughs> Uh, yeah, Thanks. but you know, I, I was suspended a couple times in in uh, high school. I got kicked out of a high school. I got um, I went to a community college. I dropped out. I went uh, ultimately for my undergraduate to um, to Evergreen State College in Olympia, Washington. No required classes, no yeah. grades. It was the only place that that was sort of loose enough where I could actually flourish. And then I dropped out of grad school twice. Yeah. Um, and ultimately I found a, a, a very unstructured program in Scandinavia that would sort of allow me to just use um, actual research. So it's not like I'm trying to, to skimp on the, the, um, the knowledge or the quality right. that, that would go into getting a doctorate, but, um, but rather than just have to take a whole bunch of classes, I just went out and did research and analyzed data and learned it yeah. and published articles in peer-reviewed journals, and then I could put those together, um, defend it as a doctoral dissertation. Hard to argue that, that I don't have the potential to make a substantive contribution to science since right. I had yeah. already yeah. done so. Um, and, and those more experiential um, uh, leanings that I have uh, certainly have informed my own teaching. So, for example, um, when I teach positive psychology at Portland State University, I, I would never create a syllabus, for oh, example, yeah. um, especially because, you know, one of the fundamental, you know, sort of ideas within positive psychology is that people want autonomy and they flourish when they have autonomy. Okay. Um, so I give the students autonomy to create their own syllabi. Oh, really? Yeah, absolutely. Almost everything I do requires more work on my behalf, which is why teachers traditionally don't do it, and yeah. that's understandable to me. Yeah. Um, but I want the, the students to create the class. I, w I want to do loads of experiential activities. I yeah. want them to work together in groups instead of individuals. I want them to do presentations and projects. I, I would much rather have someone um, go and interview a Nobel Prize winner than to look up some citations yeah. on economics or, or medicine. Yeah. Um, and so I always encourage my students, like, just contact that researcher directly, talk yeah. to them. Yeah. You know, uh, yes, read their, read their work, but, um, yeah. but don't stop there. Make this the most extraordinary learning opportunity of your entire life. Yeah, you know, take don't, full yeah, this <laughs> isn't, it, yeah, this isn't just a five-page paper you have to slog through. Like, right. yeah. you should want to make it whatever you want, and I, yeah. I negotiate with them all the time. I allow them to, to make variations, uh, yeah. and um, yeah. So it sounds kind of similar to what you're doing in the Montessori school, like getting everybody to work together, but you're saying that's more work for you? It's tons more work from, from the teaching point of view, because yeah. um, because you have everyone sort of working on something different. It, in some ways, it's okay. more individualized. Yeah. It, um, I allow students to create their own grading structure. Oh, really? uh, how, uh, what criteria do you want to be graded on? Let's not pretend that testing, you know, on a multiple choice test is the best measure of learning. Um, yeah. But some people do gravitate that way and, and oh, they yeah. do really appreciate the pressure of having to, to learn stuff for a test. Other people want to write papers. Yeah. Others um, are, are just more verbal and they want to do presentations or they want to do a group uh, activity or they want to keep a, a journal. And, and while I would never only grade someone on a journal alone, yeah. I would certainly be willing to to um, recognize that as, as legitimate effort in learning. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So, I mean, it sounds great, and it sounds like a, a new approach that you know maybe do you think other people could could adopt? I I, I think that it is certainly scalable, and that other yeah. teachers can adopt it. You yeah. you have to um, be a certain type of person to adopt it. I yeah. think you have to be willing to to shoulder a bit more. Um, pedagogical burden. Yeah. I think you have to um, have a certain amount of confidence a, yeah. as an instructor to sort of veer 
from the podium and, and right. into the aisles of, yeah. of your lecture hall. 